Today I'm going to talk about the Sony SS CS5 version 2. These just came out within like the last month or so, I believe. And in my opinion, they are a nice upgrade from the previous version. However, the previous version went on sale often for like a hundred bucks a pair. These currently retail for $250 a pair. The main difference is, at least according to the specs, which I'll show here, to me, is that this particular speaker has additional bracing, which helps tame some of the resonant issues that the previous speaker had. The previous speaker to me was just way too resonant, had a lot of lingering vocal notes and upper frequency notes that just stood out for way too long due to the enclosure. It does look like they've added some additional bracing, which you can see here that I'm pointing to in this video, namely in the corners, but also on the side and they additionally braced some more on the front baffle. Now, I don't know that the previous version did not have some of this bracing or maybe even all of it, but from what I can see in pictures online, it does look like they did do legitimate additional bracing in this new model. Sony also says they are using an upgraded crossover. Now I cannot verify this because I don't have the old version on hand, but I did find these pictures online for you to compare against. This is the old. And then this is the new one. The overall sound quality of this speaker, at least based on what I recall going back at looking at my notes and my previous review, I would say that I like this speaker more. Now I don't have both speakers at the same time to compare side by side. So keep that in mind. And our oral memory is garbage. Like whatever you thought you heard yesterday could be totally different from if you listen to it again. So keep that in mind as I'm talking about what I heard before. But having gone back and looked at my notes and look at the measurements, what I would say is that this speaker is going to be more on the mellow side. If you like a speaker that has more of an aggressive tonality to it, more sharpness in the high frequency region, then the previous version is going to be for you. If you're like me and you like a more neutral sound, then this version is going to be for you. There is a mid-range dip, which the previous version also had, that is noticeable, but it doesn't stand out in a way that causes you to go, oh, that's painful. So I'd prefer to have a dip in that region than a peak. Now, if you have equalization, then a peak in that area, you could maybe bring it down some. But without equalization, a minor dip through that region of about one to two decibels, I can tolerate that. I wouldn't want it, but I can tolerate it. Going to the higher frequency, upper mid-range and treble region. Again, sounds smooth, certainly smoother than the previous version, but there are a couple little issues that I caught on to. One is there is some mild sibilance in the lower treble region, and I would say around three to four to five kilohertz. And I noticed this particularly in the S and the T sounds. Those seem to stand out a little bit more than they should have when I was comparing to the MoFi Source Point 10 Master Edition. Now I know this isn't a fair fight, but the MoFi is just on another level. It's a great speaker to do some of these comparisons against just to see, hey, how close can a $250 pair of speakers come to uh, $3,500 pair of speakers. They're pretty far off, but still it's fun. The other thing that I noticed about these Sony speakers is that there is some forwardness in the mid range. And I primarily noticed this with Nora Jones vocals. Anytime that her voice would linger a little bit, it would stand out more sharply with her vocals. Now, some other artists I noticed it as well, but this was primarily where I noticed it. In comparison to the previous version, I would prefer to buy this version at the same price. Now, if you're looking at the previous version and you have equalization and the previous version is hundred bucks, just save money, get the previous version, use EQ, bring some things down, and then you'll be okay. The bass output of this version does sound a little bit more hefty. And when I look at the data for these speakers and compare them, you can see that the new version actually has about two decibels more of 60 Hertz than the previous version. Now, this makes sense to me because in the previous version, I was thinking, ah, they kind of roll off around 70. And with this particular version in my room, I was saying maybe closer to 60. So they get a little bit further down, not a lot. And you're still going to need a subwoofer, but they do get a little bit further down. All in all, I do think these are pretty good speakers. Would I recommend them over another speaker? So let's talk about the Polk XT20. That's a speaker that I often recommend. It's a really good speaker, has great directivity, which means that the sound that is going out into the room is very similar in tonality of the sound that's coming directly toward your ear. And in that case, it's also very easy to EQ a speaker that has good directivity. The Polk XT20 also has a more linear profile 
except for the high frequency where it tends to peak up a little bit. But with equalization, you can bring that down or with a tone knob control and the high frequency, you can just bring that down a little bit. So Polk XT20 versus Sony CS or SSCS 5M2. I think I'm gonna go with the Polk. The Sony does look kind of nice. And I will say that just holding it in my hand compared to the Polk before, the Polk felt a little bit unbalanced. Some people call me unbalanced, but hey, it is what it is. And the reason I say that is because the Polk used a huge ferrite magnet. As you can see here, the Sony does not use a large magnet motor. And overall, the drive units are rather small. So the SPL capability of the Polk is also higher. But some of you may prefer the slimmer design and the lighter weight of the Sony. In terms of soundstage and envelopment and holography and all those other fun audiophile words, this speaker sounds kind of flat. Now, comparing it back to back with that MoFi speaker, the MoFi speaker has a very great sense of envelopment, soundstage 3D-ism. And when I flip over to the Sony doing level match blind testing, which, hey, no point in doing blind testing with a speaker because I can see both of them in front of me. But regardless, I did try to level match them in the mid-range. When I switch back over to the Sony, it kind of just falls flat again, where the MoFi is just, I guess the best way for me to describe it is the MoFi sounds like it has a sphere of sound around it, whereas the Sony is just kind of a plane. It's like, it's like playing Mario on the NES versus playing Mario on the Switch. Now here comes a minor gripe. Sony calls this speaker a three-way design. When you think of a three-way design, you most likely think of woofer, mid-range, tweeter. They call this a three-way design because it has mid-woofer, tweeter, super tweeter. That super tweeter gives them the three-way design, and in my opinion, it's superfluous. Uh, hmm. I feel like I said that wrong, but I'm going to go with it. I just think, like, what's the point? And to be honest with you, for me, the super tweeter doesn't really do much. I mean, maybe it adds a little bit more spaciousness to the top end, but it doesn't kick in until a really high frequency. And I think it just adds more complexity than it's worth. I really wish what they had done is maybe taken that money and added it to an extra component in the crossover between the midwoofer and the tweeter, because I think the overall result probably would have been better. I also must say that I really do like the waveguide look of this speaker. Now, going back to the previous version, it's pretty much the same. The previous version had some gloss etching around it, and it just honestly it looked kind of cheap. But this one just looks more well-defined because it doesn't have that gloss etching around it. This version looks more modern and I think is probably going to be more spouse-friendly. Now, in terms of overall output, this is not an output monster. It is certainly limited in SPL. I would say like the mid-90s at a few meters is probably all you're going to be able to get. And that's in terms of also dynamic peaks for moderate volume listening in midfield, far field. So let's just ballpark it and say 75 to 85 decibels up to maybe three to four meters. I think that's reasonable without running into too much distortion. And the distortion that you're gonna run into is gonna be mainly due to the compression aspect. And it's gonna sound quite grainy and it's gonna grit on your ears. So if you turn it down some, you'll relieve some of that issue. Now in terms of instantaneous dynamics, like Let's talk about mid-bass punch at low output volume versus high output volume. If you're listening to something that has a nice kick drum to it, you're going to shave off a couple dB from that kick drum as you go from low volume to high volume instantaneously. Or let's say you're listening to low volume and then you turn it up some more. You're going to notice that that bass, that mid-bass response below about 120 hertz is going to be shelved a little bit more. And you're going to be wondering, where did the bass go? So that's one issue with compression on these speakers. But again, we're talking about $250 pair of speakers. I think anybody that is reasonable is going to understand that these speakers are going to be limited in SPL. And most likely if you're using them for maybe a budget oriented home theater system, you're going to use a subwoofer. And my recommendation would be to cross the subwoofer to these speakers at about 120 Hertz. I know that some people believe that if you go above 80 hertz, then bass becomes directional, but that's not how it works. 
What really matters is the integration between the subwoofer and the mains. Now I can integrate a subwoofer at 200 Hertz with the mains, as long as the subwoofer is relatively close to the mains and I have an all pass filter and configurability for the crossover network. But outside of that, if we're talking about your standard 80 Hertz crossovers, you're probably gonna be okay. But if you wanna to listen to higher output levels, if you can, I would consider bumping it up to 120, maybe even 120 Hertz crossover with that sub main integration and see what you think. You're gonna get some more dynamic capability out of your mains by doing that. Now, as an example, when I talk about the distortion being high and you're running into compression issues and a grainy sound at full, full range capability, this is what you look at. For the green, that's 96 decibel equivalent at one meter. So the further you get away, the lower that volume gets, but then you add another speaker to it. Now you've got six decibels again of output, at least in the bass range. So if we look at this 3% distortion threshold, I'm showing about 88 decibels is probably gonna be your cap. And I think for most rooms that probably also translates quite well. But if you use a subwoofer and cross this thing over at 80 Hertz, your distortion lowers a lot. Notice that it went from up here to down here. What does that translate to? That translates into a more natural sound in the mid range. And you're gonna notice that difference pretty quickly if you turn the volume up on these really high, let them run full range, and then cut them like you're gonna use them with a subwoofer. You'll immediately notice the detail in that mid range that you would not have noticed otherwise. And this is not hi-fi nonsense. This is things that I've actually provided data on and listening tests on in other videos. So it's a real thing. That's why I encourage you consider that crossover slope and that crossover point, I should say, on your subwoofer. In terms of impedance, these speakers should be just fine on an AVR. You don't need a high powered separate amplifier. It would just be a total waste of money. Go with your standard three, four, five hundred dollar AVR. You'll be okay. That does it for this review. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, let me know in the comments section below. If you want to help support this channel, you can do so a couple different ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, where you get behind the scenes info, get to vote on things that I'm going to be reviewing. Sometimes I do giveaways or garage sales and things of that nature. You can also use any of my generic affiliate links to Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Walmart, et cetera, et cetera. They're all right here in this description box. Just click one of those and then go buy anything that you want to buy from that outlet. And I should note, I bought these speakers myself and during the teardown of these, I actually damaged the midwoofers. So I'm hoping that I can get a replacement wood <laughs> midwoofer. And if I do, I'll just give them away to somebody on Patreon. All right. So that's it. Talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.